Good evening, Wisdom Eccentrics by Nat Chang Rinpoche, Chapter 15. Rinpoche had asked me to stay for dinner on this occasion and I was overjoyed. It seemed as if I'd turned a corner and that I'd been accepted in some way. I was still capable of idiocy in his eyes, but I got the feeling that he accepted that I was trying extremely hard not to be an idiot. Chapter 15, The Working Class Hero Yeah, Rinpoche exclaimed. You are here, he continued, but his volume didn't seem to betoken rage. Will today be different? Are you Tomyo or...? Yeah, today there is no need to answer this question. We will see. Maybe today you are not Tom Yor. So, Rinpoche began, you are a working class Nakpa. Also, Chimmy Rigsin Rinpoche is the son of a blacksmith, and there are many Tibetan Tom Yors who say this is low class. Eh, hey, Hong. Because of this, these Tom Yors think they do not need to respect this great yogi. Rinpoche shook his head in disgust. Eh, hey, Hong, Tomyo. Dorje Legpa is a blacksmith, but they chant his druptab every day. What kind of Tomyo does this? Drupchen Sogpo Palgiyeshe, one of the 25 disciples of Guru Rinpoche, was a blacksmith. Was he to be despised for this? No, Rinpoche. My father came from a family where there were blacksmiths and some were known for their great strength. Oh yeah, this is good. Maybe because you come from blacksmiths, you can be cured of being a Tomyo. I heard that Palgi Yeshe had immense physical strength, I replied, not daring to agree with Rinpoche that I'm sure I can be cured, but you'd have to hold me over a smoky fire like a herring. I was often sorry that Rinpoche had no access to my sense of humour. He must have found me entirely dull and insipid. Rinpoche seemed to notice that thoughts had crossed my mind. Yeah, and when Yeshe Jeanne met him for the first time, he realised that Paugi Yeshe had great potential as a practitioner. Paugi Yeshe was sitting in lotus posture. He was working his bellows with remarkable ease and relaxed concentration. Yeshe Junnu apprenticed himself to the Sokpo and learnt the art of blacksmithing at the same time as introducing the Sokpo to the inner tantras. The final transmission which Yeshe Jeanne gave was of such intensity that the Sogpo's mind united with the meanings he'd heard in the sound of his hammer upon his own anvil. The transmission took the form of Yeshe Jeanne swallowing the shards of glowing iron which flew into the air when Sogpo was working. I heard that Paugi Yeshe rescued Yeshe Jeanne from his enemies and had to overcome two prison guards in order to free him from his dungeon. Oh yeah, it was at this point that Yeshe Jeanne gave him transmission of Dorje Purba. After this he accomplished the Druptab and was able to tame wild animals with ease. He could calm predatory beasts by seizing their necks with his bare hands. Did you know this? Yes, Rinpoche. What did you know? That he was even able to restrain the tigers in the lower reaches of Mon. Yeah, it's good that you know this. Throughout his life, he never lived in houses or caves. He preferred the wild forested mountains where he would live in rough shelters between glacial torrents. At the end of his life, he attained Rainbow Body. But now I will talk about Paltrol again, because there is much you must know about Tibetan Tomyors. 
there were too many Tomyors in Tibet. So when I tell you that you are a Tomyor, it is not because you are an Inji. Tsar Paltrel, footloose and fancy free as befitted his mien, was always coming across situations in which he could encourage the passage of events to do what they would. Whilst roaming the highlands of Kham, Paltrel came upon a company of religious types travelling to the south. He asked one of the monks, I wonder whether, as a practitioner, I might join you on your journey. The monk replied, I see no reason why not. I'll ask one of the lamas in our caravan, and if he's agreeable, there'll be no difficulty, as long as you pitch in with the work, that is. Paltrel seemed pleased with the arrangement. Sure, I'm not a lazy man. I'm always happy to do my share. The agreement of one of the lamas was sought and gained, and Paltrel was immediately put to work gathering firewood. Paltrel was evidently entirely willing to do whatever he was asked, and the monks soon realised they were on to a good thing. Soon he was doing a share of everyone's work. Behind his back, the monks shared a jest about it. Hey, this village Nakpa sure knows the best kind of practice, doesn't he? And so it went on. One day, Paltrel asked, What do you do when you don't have the work of the camp to do? The monk looked at him curiously, wondering whether their run of luck with the hard-working village Nakpa had come to an end. Oh, we have no free time. All our time is spent practising. Paltrel looked surprised. Yatsen! The monk felt relieved that he wasn't going to be put on the spot and smiled back indulgently, feeling confident of his superior position. That's just perfect, continued Paltrel. What a thing it must be to be a monk such as you and your colleagues here. The monk smiled self-consciously, suddenly feeling wary again. Yes, it's the way of virtue as laid down by the Buddha. Paltrel shook his head wide-eyed and ostensibly amazed. Really, you don't say? That's marvellous. This was getting a trifle uncomfortable for the monk, who had begun to feel guilty about his pretenses. He therefore decided he'd better ask a question, if only to change the subject. What do you do for religious practice? Paltrel looked sheepish. Me? Oh, well, I just do my best to leave my mind as it is. The monk giggled at this. Poor fellow, you don't know too much about religion, do you? Paltrel shook his head. Seems that way. Surely does seem that way, but I'm happy to help you all create merit and share in that a little if I can. The monk smiled nervously and excused himself, not knowing what to make of the conversation in which he'd just engaged. Was this village Nakpa a kindly, well-mannered simpleton, or what? Still, as long as he continued to do the bulk of the work, it seemed better not to ask too many questions. After a week, they arrived in the vicinity of a Kagyu Gompa, where an empowerment was going to be given by Tashi Ursa Rinpoche, one of the major disciples of Kongtrul Lodru Taye. The travelling assembly of ecclesiastics got wind of this and decided it would be good to attend. Camp was pitched. The lama's horses were decked out in the prescribed manner, exquisitely caparisoned with ornately carved and gilded saddles. The lamas and their attendants wore their finest robes and hats for the occasion and arrived with parasols and banners fluttering. The entourage displayed the profusion of polychromatic religious pageantry of which only the Tibetan sense of grandiosity is capable. It caused great wonder amongst the villagers who arrived to admire the spectacle of their arrival. 
Paltrow was something of an embarrassment to the calculated dignity of the monastic cavalcade and waited until a discreet interval had elapsed before he followed them into the courtyard of the Gompa. The place was very crowded for the empowerment and at its conclusion it took several hours for Tashi Urser Rinpoche to bless the assembly. First came the highest of the visiting dignitaries with whom he touched foreheads, then the lesser whose heads he touched with both hands. Then came others according to rank and gradually the touch of one hand was followed by the touch of a yak hair whisk. The very last of all to receive a blessing was Paltrow, but Urser Rinpoche had seen him coming and was too quick. Before Paltrow had approached the throne, Urser Rinpoche had handed him the yak hair whisk and was performing full prostrations. Urser Rinpoche offered his throne to Paltrow and took the lower one for himself. When they had seated themselves, and to the amazement of all, Urser Rinpoche introduced the great Tsar Paltrow Rinpoche, friend of his own teacher, Kongtrul Ludro Thaye. I have the idea, I said to Rinpoche as soon as he'd finished. For once I wanted to jump in immediately to show that I wasn't completely docile. Part of Paltrow's personality display is to fall in with situations simply in order that people could experience their own patterning. This seems to be a method that is far more powerful than confronting people with their bigoted attitudes. Rinpoche nodded. Oh yeah, he exclaimed. That's it. Today you are not a Tomyor. He then rubbed the back of his neck whilst looking around the room. It was almost as if he was looking for something. Then he fixed me with his stare. This is precisely why Paltrow did the monks work for them and why he asks them what they do with their time off. He gives them the opportunity to examine their actions of body, voice and mind, but they're not able to understand. This makes the lesson he teaches even stronger. A response was wanted, I could tell, and this time I had one. So it wasn't simply a matter of floating with the situations in which he found himself. He actually participated in the situation that was being created. Rinpoche nodded and gave a slight smile, the one that betokened right answer. You have to be creative with your intelligence, but not too creative, Rinpoche asserted. Paltrow said just enough for the results of his actions to have effect. You must be highly precise to act in this way. I could see that. Do you think that Paltrow knew that Urser Rinpoche was the Lama giving the empowerment? This seemed to amuse Rinpoche. I didn't ask why my question was amusing, which was probably just as well, because he had something further to add. You can't always know what will happen. Mostly, you have to go into emptiness and simply see what happens. Rinpoche chuckled. You will have to do this so many times. That sounded both intriguing and disturbing but I decided not to ask any questions about it. Better to leave the future to itself. Rinpoche, I asked, after a moment or two had passed, this quality of Paltrow, that he'd wander round anonymously, was this common within the Nyingma tradition? Kunzang Doje Rinpoche nodded. Sure and also in the Drigung and Drukpa Kagyu schools where there were many holders of the Gurkha Changlode. The first Dodrukchen and his friend Jigme Nyugu often behaved in a similar way, but they didn't wander as extensively as Paltrow. Maybe he learnt this style from them when he was young.